Side Chapter 52 The Threats Group Up Joseph and the others with him, having landed safely on the ground thanks to their parachutes, regrouped to discuss what they should do next. They were hesitant to contact the government of the South American country that had requested this mission or the government of the federal states, and they were also hesitant to contact the Braver's headquarters. After all, they had just been attacked by a federal state's government fighter aircraft. This couldn't have been a renegade act by a pilot with radical beliefs. It was unclear as to where the fighter aircraft had taken off from, but if it really was just a renegade pilot, the base would have had enough time to contact the transport aircraft and give warning that a fighter aircraft with a dangerous pilot was headed their way. And this guarded escort mission had been planned in absolute secrecy. Given that it had been leaked, this was certainly no ordinary situation. I see. I get it, said the Chiron Derrick, nodding. The one who leaked the information about our mission might be someone in the operations department who is close to Rakudu. So, you want to avoid contacting headquarters until we understand the situation. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, that's basically it. It would be a shame if we were to call for rescue, only for our bomber aircraft to come at us this time, said the Sandman Yudu, smiling with satisfaction at having successfully persuaded Derek to follow this plan. But we're saying that we suspect Rakudu himself, not someone close to Rakudu, he added. Joseph, Yudu, and Nanamori were three reincarnated individuals who had been guided by Vandalyu and granted his divine protection. They had been trying to persuade Derek, a reincarnated individual who wasn't like them, as well as the pilots of the transport aircraft, to follow their plan. The reasons for that were exactly as Yudu had explained. They didn't believe that Derek and the pilots were on Rakudu's side. Even in that situation, Derek had given orders that prioritized the survival of Joseph, Yudu, Nanamori, and the pilots over his own. It's true that we can't rule out the possibility that Rakudu himself leaked information about our mission or that he's the mastermind behind this whole incident. I understand that this is the logical conclusion. But there's no reason to suspect Rakudu specifically over anyone else, right? said Derek. He wasn't on Rakudu's side, but like Amamiya, he considered Rakudu to be a trustworthy companion. If he knew that the one piloting the fighter aircraft had been another reincarnated individual, the slave near Nishikaga Yoshihiko, he would likely have believed that Rakudu was involved. But even Joseph, the one who had repelled the aircraft, didn't know that Nishikaga had been the pilot. And since Nishikaga had fallen into the sea or onto the ground, there was no evidence. If the crime syndicate leader that they had been supposed to pick up at their destination and provided a guarded escort for wasn't there, or had never existed to begin with, that might have been another piece of evidence for Derek to suspect Rakudu, the one who had assigned them this mission in the first place. But because this was a top-secret mission, Joseph and the others didn't know the name or face of this crime syndicate leader. And since they couldn't contact the people at their intended destination, they couldn't confirm who he was or whether he even existed. Well, I suppose that's what anyone would think. There's no proof, after all, said Yudu. Especially with a story like ours. You'd think we were on drugs or off our meds, agreed Nanamori. Yudu, Nanamori, and Joseph were bravers who had taken time off missions due to mental problems. On the other hand, Rakudu had worked tirelessly to make up for the bravers who had been lost, and he now essentially served as a deputy leader for the organization who brought everyone together. Who Derek would choose to believe was obvious, as he was unaware of what Rakudu had been doing in secret. Hey, hey, I didn't go that far. You guys improved your abilities through your own hard work, didn't you? If you're capable of doing that, I don't consider you to be unreliable or untrustworthy, said Derek. But I'm just saying, we can't conclude for certain that Rakudu is guilty. It was the clear choice for Derek to believe Rakudu, but he didn't take the words of Yudu and the others lightly either. He believed that they had their own reasons and conclusions for suspecting Rakudu. That was why he didn't insist on contacting Rakudu like he had originally suggested. But what are we going to do now? We can't just not contact anyone. Search parties should be on their way to look for us, too, said Derek. 
I suppose so. The federal states and this country that we've crashed in have both probably noticed that the signal of the transport aircraft is gone, after all. For now, it would be nice if we could get in contact with someone we can trust, like Aurika, said Yudu. Not Amamiya? Come to think of it, he knew about our mission, just like Rakudu, said Derek. It seemed that Derek considered Amamiya to be a suspect as well, but Yuda decided not to answer as he couldn't provide Derek with an explanation as to why that wasn't the case. How is it? Have you managed to get a connection? He asked the pilots. They had brought radio equipment with them from the transport aircraft, and the pilots were trying to contact Ulrika with it. It's no good. It seems that it broke from the impact of the fall, one of the pilots said. The radio equipment, a marvel of the latest magical and scientific technology, had turned into a mere box that only produced noise. Incidentally, Derek and the others couldn't use their phones, there was a risk that their locations could be traced. Joseph sighed. Derek, and you too over there. Could you please pretend not to see what I'm about to do? From his pocket, he produced a mobile phone with a design unlike any that Derek had ever seen. What is that phone? And what do you mean, pretend not to see? Are you saying we should pretend we never saw this phone? Derek asked. That's right. With this phone, we can contact someone we can trust. There's no risk of our locations being traced either. But this is a top-secret piece of equipment. Even when the transport aircraft was in danger of being shot down, I decided that I wouldn't use this unless absolutely necessary, said Joseph. That's why I want you to pretend you never saw it. Well, it is possible that in the worst-case scenario, the world will be in a state that it won't matter whether you keep it a secret or not, but still, please do, just in case. Yudu and Nanamori gasped. Joseph, are you planning to use that? Yudu exclaimed. It's true that now's the time to use it, but you could have done it while the two of us drew Derek and the pilot's attention, Nanamori pointed out. Derek sensed that something extraordinary was about to happen. All right, I promise. You guys should promise, too, he said to the pilots. Of course, one pilot said. I trust the people who saved our lives, said the other. Having gained their agreement, Joseph held up this phone. Transform. The phone turned into a liquid that crawled up his arm and spread all over his body, forming a bodysuit. Gee goddamn. Derek shouted. What the hell was that? Is this some kind of state-of-the-art power suit? In origin, a world where magic existed, power suits were used for military purposes. But they were shaped more like an inner clothing layer to be worn under the wearer's military uniform, not like a heavy suit of armor. They were magic items that were light and flexible but provided protection similar to a bulletproof vest and a certain degree of resistance to heat, as well as a boost to the wearer's physical capabilities at the cost of only a small quantity of mana. These had been worn by the now-deceased Baylor Johnny, his subordinates, and the slave near Nishikaga. But portable power suits didn't exist, as far as Derek knew. But what is that design? You look like a character from a tokusatsu show for kids, Derek said with a dry laugh. Translator's note, tokusatsu is a genre of Japanese TV aimed at children. For reference, the Power Rangers were inspired by a tokusatsu show. Joseph was now wearing a flashy cape and a helmet with decorations on it. Yeah, he apparently got some inspiration from those, Joseph said. The transformation equipment provided by Bonda greatly surpassed the military power suits used in this world in terms of performance and function. Despite that, Joseph hadn't used it yet because this design was too flashy and conspicuous. Of course, another big reason was that its technology was far too advanced for this world. But its functions are top class. It has communication functions as well. This is Joseph. Are you able to talk now? said Joseph, making contact with Bonda right in front of Derek. After listening for a few moments, he gave a startled gasp. 
So, things have progressed to this point. He learned of the attack on the Amamiya residents and the attack on Narumi's group. He had assumed that he and his group were the only ones Rakudu had tried to eliminate silently, but now he realized how serious the situation was, with Rakudu having made bold moves with no regard to appearances. If they had thoughtlessly contacted the Federal States or the Bravers' headquarters, there really might have been a bomber aircraft on its way to them right now. So. What? What do we want to eat? Um, a anything is fine. That only makes it harder to decide? But even if you say that. After conversing for a while, Joseph ended the call. He's apparently coming to pick us up and buy us some food while he's at it, he told Derek and the others. Ah, that's very helpful, said Derek, assuming that Joseph had been talking to a personal acquaintance at the local government of this country or something. But Yudu and Natamori had a pressing question, how? Rikudu was delivered a report that the fighter aircraft piloted by the slate near Nishikaga had disappeared from the radar and contact had been lost. I thought that I had a grasp over everything, and everything was in the palm of my hand, but this is simply too unexpected, he muttered, putting a hand on his forehead. Just what in the world is this monstrosity? Is it normal for imaginary friends these days to be completely unharmed after being showered in bullets and spells, fly around at high speeds while carrying a van, and destroy my plans? Rikudu had realized that the monstrosity that had appeared was Banda, the imaginary friend that Amamiya May had drawn. He had realized this, but he hadn't realized what Banda's true identity was. If he knew that Banda was teaching May death attribute magic, he would likely have realized that Banda was the same person as the undead, but... The only thing he knew at the moment about Banda was that he was a monstrosity and that he was very mobile. Reports were coming in one after another. The target is flying around, completely ignoring the air defenses of every nation. It's ignoring all transmitted communications from the fighter jets that have been scrambled and deployed. No, it's possible that it's simply not capable of receiving those transmissions. But at the very least, it's something that appears on the radar. That might be because it is carrying a van underneath it. Banda itself doesn't react to anything other than mana sensors. Given that, we believe it isn't a living creature, it is a kind of spirit that is made of mana. This is corroborated by our autopsy on Baylor, which shows no evidence of any person being involved in his death other than Baylor himself. However, that raises the question as to why Baylor didn't steal its mana. Based on our analysis of the footage, it is almost impossible to damage Banda with currently existing heavy firearms. Though it's unclear as to how, the van in which Amamiya May is riding is also being protected by a similar armor. There have also been videos uploaded to video sharing websites. It seems that they used the drive through service at a fast food restaurant after visiting a supermarket, and they paid using Baylor's credit card. None of these reports contained anything that Rakudu could use to think of an effective plan. The only thing he knew was that Banda was likely invincible against anything other than the cheat-like abilities of the Bravers and Death Attribute Magic. But if Banda and May were the only enemies of Rakudu and his allies, they might have been able to deal with this threat. After all, they were reincarnated individuals, and they were protected by their fortunes. But the Echo Ulrika, another reincarnated individual, was on Banda and May's side. The angel Amamiya Narumi had joined them as well, and they were now on the way to the location of the druid Joseph and the others. This was enough to nullify the fortunes that protected Rakudu and the reincarnated individuals on his side. When reincarnated individuals clashed with each other, their fortunes cancelled each other out, regardless of the numbers on each side. Rikudu was well aware of this fact, as this was the very phenomenon he had attempted to take advantage of in order to eliminate Alrika, Joseph, Narumi, and the others. With the fortunes cancelling each other out, the side that had made proper preparations and caught the enemy off guard would be the one to survive. But Banda and the reincarnated individuals who had been strengthened by him had overcome the preparations made by Rikudu and his allies, leading to Baylor and Sleipnir being killed with ease. 
Sleipnir and a fighter aircraft might be able to shoot them out of the sky. No, it's pointless to make a plan based on someone who's already dead, Rakuta muttered. This is conjecture on my part, but if this Banda is a being that Amamiya May has created, or some kind of evil spirit or guardian spirit that haunts her, then would you not be able to defeat it by targeting Amamiya May herself, suggested a subordinate, despite knowing that Rakuta considered Amamiya May to be an important sample. Rakuta showed no anger or irritation at this suggestion, but he didn't accept it either. It is true that this may be possible. But that monstrosity seems to be aware of that as well. When it killed Baylor, it protected her inside its own fur along with Echo, and in Africa, inside a van covered in an armor that is as hard as its own body. Targeting Amamiya May directly will be difficult. His reasoning was logical, and the subordinates were convinced and stepped back. But they were surprised by Rakuta's next words. Recall the subordinates and limited death attribute mages from Africa, and prepare for a counterattack. A subordinate gasped. They're going to come here? A shiver ran up the spines of Maria and the other subordinates. The existence of this headquarters was top secret. Even among Rakuta's collaborators, only those in powerful positions in society knew of it, presidents of countries and chiefs of intelligence agencies. Rakuta had even kept his distance from the Baylor Johnny and Slape near Nishikaga, the only thing they knew was the email address displayed on their devices when they received their orders from him. But there was a large hole from which their information had leaked, the metamorph Shihu and Mari. They will come. Black Maria used some method that we failed to foresee to return to being metamorph, and she and the experimental subjects with her have rendezvoused with Amamiya. The improvements to her body and the experiments involving her were carried out here, Rakuta said. The experimental subjects that had been turned into limited death attribute magic users were still uncompromised, but Rakudu and his subordinates had assumed that they had full control over Metamorph, and none of them had ever even considered the possibility of information leaking through her. It was possible that they had talked about the location of this headquarters and its layout in front of her. But we can't even be sure that Metamorph remembers it. And there is no guarantee that she has ties to that monstrosity, one subordinate said desperately. No, we should prepare for the worst. I can't imagine that the monstrosity will be taking the children on a picnic and going home after this, said the shaman Maria Kusuk. Rikudu-san, let's gather our collaborators at our headquarters as we planned. They're certain to have noticed the abnormality of this situation, but they likely haven't realized how serious it is. We can't have them abandon us now. Rikudu nodded in agreement. That's what I intend to do. And let's proceed with preparations for our last resort. Now that an unexpected threat has appeared, we will likely be forced to abandon our initial safe plan. After stocking up on food and snacks from a supermarket in a certain African country, as well as buying hamburgers, fried chicken, and pizza at a drive thru Banda's group flew across the ocean to the continent of South America. Fighter aircraft threatened them along the way, but Banda shook them off with his sheer speed and unmatched mobility, and then landed where Joseph and the others were waiting. Derek and the two pilots were petrified in shock and fear at the sight of Banda, but they became quiet after Joseph and the others explained things to them. Jesus! To think that Rakudu was really a traitor who was pulling the strings of Murakami and the others, and Baylor and Shaman are with him as well. I can't believe it! It's a big surprise that Narumi's daughter can use death attribute magic, but Rakudu's betrayal is so shocking that I don't care about that right now, said Derek. Derek, I feel the same way, but, it's the truth. Well, I do care about May's magic, though, said Narumi. Derek and Narumi were both surprised and crushed by the truth that had been revealed to them by Alrika. Even Derek, who had only half believed Joseph and the others, was unable to deny it. The Avalon Rakudu Hajiri had been one of the leading members of the Bravers who had supported Amamiya Hirodo ever since he founded the Bravers, just like the now deceased Ndukuya and Minami Asagi. Rakudu had never stood out back then, but through the battle against the Eighth Guidance, he had become Amamiya's right-hand man. 
Now, he was responsible for a diverse range of things, he directed the operations of the Bravers, coordinated activities with the United Nations, the governments of various countries, investigation organizations, and intelligence agencies, and made media appearances. Him betraying the Bravers was fatal to the organization. Amamiya and everyone else had spread out across the world on missions assigned by Rakudu and almost been killed, not suspecting him of a thing. And it was also fatal to the world. This is the end of the Bravers, huh, said Derek, crestfallen. There's no way this scandal can be covered up. It's a huge crime. Calling it a scandal would be an understatement. Well, I would say that it's the end of a lot more things than just the Bravers. After all, even if Rakudu is the mastermind, there are people helping him and making their armies obey him, said Banda's voice coming through the van speakers, attempting to cheer Derek up. That's precisely why we'll be blamed even more, even if we suppress Rakudu and the others. They'll blame Rakudu and they'll blame the Bravers for their negligence that led to all this. They'll throw us to the wolves without blinking an eye if it means that they'll distract even the smallest amount of public investigations away from themselves. After all, one of ours is the mastermind. Rikudu's collaborators included important figures in political and business circles and mass media all over the world. If they were to conspire in order to save themselves, Derek, Narumi, and the rest of the Bravers would all be helpless. In that case, I'll do some punishing, at least for the people of the federal states, said Banda. It was Rakuta's collaborators in the federal states that had deployed military golems to attack the Amamiya residents and a fighter aircraft to shoot Joseph and the others out of the sky. It was their actions that had led up to this point. Even if they were able to protect themselves through information manipulation and political maneuvering, Banda's punishment would await them. Are you gonna meet them? said May, who had been eating snacks, but reacted to the word punishing. Bond paused his conversation with Derek to concentrate on May instead. Yes, I'm going to meet the bad people who messed up your house, Mekuin, and the ones that tried to do scary things to Uncle Joseph and the others. Translator's note, the humor here is difficult to explain, but I'll give it a shot. The correct version of the verb at use here is slash masuru, which means to destroy. May and Banda are using a childlike form of the verb slash metasuru, which is kinda like do a me, destruction. And then there is also the fact that it sounds similar to May's name. Dandelu didn't intend to destroy their souls, but his intention to destroy their bodies wasn't a lie. May wants to me them too, Banda. Hmm, it might be a little too early for you, Mekuin. And it's something that needs to be done late at night. You won't be able to wake up in time for breakfast, you know? Ah. I won't, then. You're such a good girl, Mekuin. A tentacle suddenly appeared inside the car and patted May's head to praise her for listening. I think I'm going to go crazy. I'm surprised you guys are all fine with this, muttered Derek, looking away from the happy and cheerful May and turning to Ulrika, Joseph, and the others. Incidentally, the two pilots, who were also in the vehicle, were trembling as they imagined what kind of fate the bosses of their organizations would meet. Fine with it, you say? Well, because it's fine. But we were just as shocked as you when we learned that Rakudu is a traitor, said Yudu. If you're talking about Banda, it's because it's Banda. If it's his tone of speech that's bothering you, I think it's because Meichan is here. You wouldn't say that you're going to kill somebody in front of a small child, would you? said Alrika. And Derek, you were looking fine just a second ago when you were eating your food, said Joseph. They were already accustomed to Banda's appearance and behavior. They had been surprised that he had decided to procure food supplies at a supermarket and a fast food restaurant, but that was all. Hey uncle, you guys are being flamed less than I thought. Or rather, all the comments are about Banda, said Hiroshi, showing them the screen of the mobile phone that he had brought with him from his house. There were several video postings of Banda, as well as threads of comments discussing what he might be. A mysterious monster, filmed from a cruiser ship. An alien appears in a high-class residential district and sucks out a human's brain. 
Has the eighth guidance returned at last? A monster buys a mountain of fried chicken and pizza in Africa. The alien's name is Johnny Yamalka. And so on. What a mess! Could it be that you did this on purpose? Derek exclaimed. No. But if I make myself invisible, the parts of me that I used to improve the van will also disappear, so I can't do that, replied Bonda. I see. It's not that I don't want to support you people at all. Joseph and Ulrika are my companions, and Mekuen and Hiroshi aren't entirely uninvolved either, said Bonda. Bonda thought that the fierce criticism directed at the Bravers because of Rakudu was something that they had brought upon themselves. But he found it aggravating and illogical that Joseph and Ulrika would be criticized as well. And it would be even more aggravating if it were to also affect May and Hiroshi's lives. And he couldn't allow only the Bravers to become the villains while the accomplices who had cooperated with Rakudu got away and continued on with their carefree lives. And I would like to say this specifically to Mekuen's mom, we're in an emergency situation until all of this is dealt with, but once it's over, I'd like you to do your best to not bring the troubles of work into the house, said Bonda. If you can promise me this, I will help you. It would be difficult for the children to rejoice and be happy if their parents were in a miserable situation. Considering that, the happiness of Amamiya Hirodo and Narumi was an obligation for him. At the very least, they would have to not be so miserable and unhappy that they could not hide it from their children. Thus, Bonda wasn't against lending them his strength. I'll do whatever it takes to protect Hiroshi and Mei, even without you telling me. I'm their mother, after all, said Narumi. She had learned that Mei was able to use death attribute magic, but she didn't see that as a problem in and of itself. To begin with, she never believed that the death attribute itself was evil. The problem was what the people of this world would try to do with the new death attribute mage, but Narumi was determined to do whatever was needed to protect her children from all that. I'm sure Hirodo feels the same way. Even if he doesn't, I'll make sure to convince him, Narumi said. It's a relief to hear that, said Banda. He was truly relieved by this answer, he had imagined that in the worst-case scenario, he might even need to make alterations to the Amamiya's brains. Banda dropped cylindrical lumps of metal that landed with loud thumps in front of Narumi and Derek. These are the prototype versions of the power suit I gave Joseph, he explained. They don't have any design elements added, and their functions to improve the wearer's physical capabilities and act as a magical medium are considerably inferior, but they should still be far beyond any ordinary power suits that are currently available. I'll lend them to you, so please make use of them. No design elements? Thank God for that, said Derek. T thanks, said Narumi as she picked up her power suit, a simple piece of transformation equipment. Her mind began pondering what Banda's true identity might be. He was teaching May death attribute magic. Could it possibly be him? Meanwhile, Amamiya's group was moving away from the ruined city, along with the metamorph Shihu and Mari and the three others who were with her. Amamiya and the others had found it very difficult to believe that Rakudu had betrayed them and was researching death attribute magic, of all things. But the words of Mari, who had been captured and brainwashed by Rakudu, were convincing, and they could not deny what she told them. She had explained in minute detail exactly what she had done while disguising herself as Rakudu and acting as his body double. This testimony served as plenty of proof of the truth. As for physical proof, the most significant was the Ares Sujiura attempting to kill her right before their very eyes. And in the building that had supposedly been occupied by terrorists were the corpses of the Sadeva De and the Artemis Catherine. Believing what Mari was telling them, Amamiya and the others were moving away from the ruins because Rakudu and his collaborators might be aware that his plan had failed. It was possible that they would bomb the ruins to cover up the evidence and kill Amamiya and everyone else. Indeed, some time after Amamiya's group left the ruins, the noise of an explosion came from the direction of the ruins, and a pillar of smoke rose into the sky. That must be the local government. 
I know there's nobody living there, but they've really gone all out, spat the Titan Iweo, who was driving a jeep. By the way, where are we going now? Where's the main base of Rakudu and his allies? The federal states? Or is it on the South or North Pole? If I recall, Rakudu bought an entire ghost town district in the Chinese Republic to use as a maneuvering area. Is that where it is? asked Amamiya, who was in the passenger seat. Mari, who was in the back seat, gave an unintelligible muffled noise in response. Sorry. Take your time to eat, said Amamiya. Mari was eating the portable rations that Catherine and De had been carrying. When Ares destroyed her head, she had already created a spare head in advance. Capable of thinking with just her soul, she had quickly replaced her destroyed head with the spare one to survive. Seeing this, Amamiya and the others assumed that she was essentially immortal, so they listened to what she had to say. The special forces members who had been assigned on this mission with the Bravers also assumed that she was immortal, which was why they had quietly listened to her explanation without protest. As a result, they all believed her. But Mari wasn't as immortal as they thought. She was able to use Metamorph to create spare brains or hearts for herself, but the materials she used to do so was her own flesh and blood. She created them with metamorph, using her own blood, bones, fat, and muscle. It wasn't that someone had made an entirely new head and just given it to her. On the surface, it had appeared that she was completely unharmed after Ares destroyed her head. But in reality, her body's weight had decreased by the same amount that her head had weighed. Naturally, if this happened two or three times, Mari would have nothing left to create new organs with, and she would simply die. She had kept that fact hidden and maintained a composed appearance because she hadn't been able to trust Amamiya and the others, at least, not until they heard what she had to say and believed her. Now that they believed her and she could trust them, she had revealed her weakness. Now, she was eating as much as she could in order to restore what she had lost. And so, Yukijoro and Gabriel, who were in the back seat with Mari, replied instead. Rakuta's main base isn't in the federal states, nor is it in the North or South Pole. It seems that there were research facilities there, but they have been abandoned, said Yukijoro. The ghost town in the Chinese Republic was bought just to draw attention away in case he was ever suspected, said Gabriel. Yukijoro, Gabriel, and Bakker were all wary of Amamiya and the others, and refused to leave Mari's side. They were afraid that if they did, they would be separated and kidnapped off somewhere else. Thus, the back seat of the jeep was considerably cramped. So where are we supposed to go? Just so you know, this jeep can't drive across the ocean, said Oweo. Bakker gave a cheerful laugh. We know that. For now, we must simply move so that we are not captured, and wait for God and the saintess to descend. I am sure you will know when the time has come. God and the saintess. Banda, the one who gave you your powers, and my daughter may, ha, huh, said Amamiya. Yes, God and the saintess. Bakker and the others had already explained everything about Banda and May, how they had met them in their dreams and been saved by them. Although it was not quite as shocking as Rakuta's betrayal, it was still enough to leave them dumbfounded. But in a way, it made sense. If contact had been made through dreams, a method that couldn't possibly be prevented, then that was why it had gone unnoticed even by Rakudu, who was clever enough to have concealed his true identity for all these years. You're free to regard May as a sacred being, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop being her father. I just want you to understand that, said Amamiya. Bakker laughed once more. Of course. We do not intend to deny that you are the father of the saintess, nor do we intend to take the saintess away from you. You seem like you're enjoying yourself quite a lot. Why is that? Is that how it looks? I apologize if I have caused any discomfort. My laughter is a side effect of their tampering with my brain. Sorry for asking such an insensitive question. Not at all, do not pay it any mind. I am not bothered by you. 
Amma Mia had wondered if the constantly laughing Bakker was speaking on the behalf of Mari and the others because they were less wary of them now, but it seemed that this was not the case. Ah, uh, these three have some delicate issues, and it might be best not to ask too many questions about them. Well, it's my fault for being so busy eating, said Mari. No, don't worry about it. It was my fault for being so inconsiderate, said Amma Mia. More importantly, how do May and the others plan to get here? We've told Bonda the place, so there's nothing to worry about. I adjusted the frequency to contact him. Does he have an antenna on him? The communication is through magic, not radio waves. He told me in my dreams. Do you know why he's attached himself to May? No. I've only ever conversed with him in my dreams, after all. I see. Over a year had passed since May began mentioning Banda's name. Amamiya felt a great anxiety over the realization that there had been an unidentified entity constantly in his daughter's presence and that it had been watching his family's private life. Nobody could blame him for wanting to forget that for a moment. By the way, what's with that appearance of yours? You've made yourself look very young, Amamiya said, trying to distract himself. I've just used Metamorph to return to my younger self. There's no reason to make an effort to look old, is there? said Mari. You know, I'm personally very surprised that you've accepted the truth more easily than I expected. I remember hearing you saying, the death attribute is something that mustn't exist, on multiple occasions when I was acting as Rakuta's body double. So that was you back then, too. My best friend really was just an illusion, it seems, Amamiya sighed. I still do feel that way about the death attribute. But that's only because I don't want tragic things like inhumane human experiments to occur for the sake of using the death attribute's power. It's not like I will never accept the existence of already existing death attribute mages like you or people like Bakker and the others. Amamiya believed that it was best for the death attribute to not exist, for the sake of preventing any further tragedy but he wouldn't tell an already existing death attribute mage that it would be best for them to not exist. In the same way, he might say that false charges shouldn't exist, for the sake of preventing tragedy, but he wouldn't kill the policemen and victims who had resulted in the false charges and cover up the evidence in order to make it so that the charges didn't exist. I'm sure you don't want to create any more death attribute mages at the cost of more miserable tragedies either Amamiya suddenly stopped mid-sentence. What in the world is that? he shouted, pointing at the sky. Something with black wings was flying towards them at a great speed. He gradually became able to see it more clearly, it had a black body that contrasted against the blue sky and was carrying a black van with its six-jointed legs. It was completely ignoring the laws of aerodynamics. The other bravers and special forces members noticed it as well and were unsure whether they were supposed to try and flee or open fire. Who could it be that this is Bonda? Amamiya stammered. Without a doubt, it is Bonda. Everyone, don't shoot Bonda or that van. Mari shouted. Oh, God. God has descended, said Bakker. And so, all of the threats to Rakudu were gathered in one place.